Well, hello and welcome to Cure America. I'm Star Parker. The death of George Floyd last year at the hands of police officer Derek Chauvin, now convicted of murder by a jury in Minneapolis, has produced great concern throughout the entire nation regarding law enforcement. The United States Senate here in Washington, D.C. is currently working on police reform legislation, and our friend, Republican Senator Tim Scott from South Carolina, has introduced reform legislation uh, that is part of the ongoing debates. He actually introduced it last year, and the Democrats filibustered it, but it's back on the table because there are some concerns about policing in the nation, and there are some laws that are national that we need to look at. We must consider whether we have issues allowing for or dis encouraging poor police behavior. We've got to take a look at this, because if we do, what can we do? The video that captured that murder of George Floyd, it shook the nation because of its cold-bloodedness. I mean, there just seemed to be no concern at all from Chauvin that he was taking a man's life. There was just no threat to him as Floyd lied there, handcuffed on the ground. This made it even more difficult to understand why Chauvin chose this deadly path to restrain his prisoners. It's not even fair to his fellow officers to have to watch this happen. The incident has brought to light many issues that affect not just the black community, but our entire nation. We want to look today at one particular issue that might be a factor that enables uh, this irresponsible behavior by some police officers. It's a legal doctrine called qualified immunity. Yep, we'll have to all look it up together. But I did, and you're going to have an interesting discussion time with us here on Cure America. The allegation is that qualified immunity allows police officers to violate the civil rights of citizens without concern that they uh, will be punished for it or that they can be legally liable. I mean, that's what we saw with Chauvin. I mean, there was just no regard. He, he thought he can get away with it. And he thought that this man is not human enough for me to consider otherwise. Whether well, police officers violate civil rights of citizens in any way, for any reason, should be concern for all of us. So we're going to look into the question of qualified immunity today. We're going to keep it really simple for all of us to understand. And we're going to discuss if this is an area of law that might need some reform. Liberals keep saying that we need to reimagine the police, and the whole police departments should be abolished, all of them, all across the country, or nationalizes what they really want so they can move toward their little totalitarian state. But we know that would be a disaster, especially if, oh, for the people in our most distressed zip codes, whether we're talking local policing, none, which is what they say they want, or national policing, which <laughs> they won't get any help when they need them. We heard the call, help, get a police officer here now, help. Yet we know that there's a problem with aggressive policing. And we, and we have to look at some serious questions behind this when it comes to the way some police officers do their job. We know Chauvin had 18 complaints against him before that fatal incident with George Floyd. So, so why was he kept on the force? This is a deep subject. And actually, uh, there are a lot of government officials that are nervous about us discussing this qualified immunity because it affects all of them. They, na they need to be protected from, from citizens that might want to uh, file a false claim uh, when they're just doing their job. So it's a really deep subject, but we're going to talk about it when it comes to reforming the police because we want safe communities. We want safe police officers. We want civility and calm and peace, according to what the scripture says we deserve when we have law enforcement and a rule of law. So the Cato Institute in Washington, D.C. has come up with some really creative solutions on this topic. So we've asked one of their leading experts to be with us, Clark Neely. He's going to help us sort through the noise of all of this news and try to find out what qualified immunity law looks like and whether we should keep it. Clark is senior vice president for criminal justice at the Cato Institute. His area of interest includes constitutional law and police accountability. He formerly served at the Institute for Justice and is an adjunct professor at the Anton Scalia School of Law at George Mason University. Oh, yes, very impressive. Very impressive. Oh, but wait till you get to my panel. My panel today, your panel today, includes two former police officers and an attorney. And they're going to help us sort through this issue, too. 
what kind of police reform really makes sense for our country. We take some tough issues today. You know we take on tough issues here at Cure America already. And so we're gonna take on this one of qualified immunity, policing reform, right after this message. Let's take a quick history lesson. Just two centuries ago, 94% of the people in the world lived in extreme poverty. Today, it's eight and a half percent. In a century, our life expectancies more than doubled. How did we come so far so fast? The freedom to create, to start a business, to keep what you earn. Don't let the socialists and radical left cost us our progress, our freedom, and our well being. It's time we fight for America and vote for America. As I told you in the opening, I have an incredible guest. You are going to appreciate that Clark Neely is with us. He is the Senior Vice President for Criminal Justice at the Cato Institute. His area of interest includes constitutional law, overcriminalization, coercive plea bargaining, police accountability, and gun rights. I'm so glad that you're here. Uh, and um, Clark was reminding me that we actually touched paths years ago on school choice matters. And I really appreciate that because it reminded us of our friendship, mutual friendship with Clint Bolick uh, from the Institute for Justice, who's now Supreme Court Justice out there in Arizona. Boy, we've been here a long time. Yeah, that's right. Well, it's so great to see you again. Thanks for having me on. You know, and now another issue, very important issue to you, you've been working on for years, has reached the front pages. A lot of people aren't even familiar with the term qualified immunity. Yep. They're wondering what is going on. They know something is going on. <clears throat> we know that policing is local. We know unions are one part of the equation. But to find out about this quality, um, uh, qualified immunity, that's a national issue that now the um, Senate is discussing, perhaps you can start us just at the basics. What is it? You bet. So the reality is that we have some police and other government officials who are very respectful of people's constitutional rights, and we want to support them and make sure that they are able to do their job and that they get the respect that they deserve. But we also know that we have police that don't respect people's constitutional rights, and they sometimes violate them. The question then becomes, how do we hold those police officers accountable and distinguish them from the good police officers? The problem with qualified immunity is that it represents um, a really bad policy that was invented out of whole cloth by the Supreme Court. Back in the wake of the Civil War, Congress enacted a law that enables anybody whose rights have been violated by a government official to have the ability to sue that person in federal court. And which, a lot of that was because yeah. you had now four million former slaves who are now citizens, and a lot of people didn't want that, and so there was some aggression there. It's exactly so right. Congress protected their interests. Yes, and it was both private individuals and government actors were violating people's rights. So mm -hmm. that law went on the books in 1871. We refer to it today as Section 1983 because that's where it appears in our code. Mm -hmm. um, that, I think, is a really uh, smart approach, right? You say, look, the good police officers will be fine when you don't violate people's rights, but if you violate people's rights, they get to take you to court. The problem is that in 1982, the Supreme Court invented out of whole cloth this defense of qualified immunity. Um, it's a fancy sounding legal term, but it's really quite simple. What it means is that even if a police officer violates your rights, maybe punches you in the face while you're wearing handcuffs, you cannot sue that person unless you can show that the exact same thing already happened wherever you are, and that a court has already told that police officer, you cannot do that exact same thing. Hmm. If that exact same case is not on the books in the place where you live, even though everybody agrees that that officer violated your rights, your case will still be thrown out of court and dismissed because of this qualified immunity defense that the Supreme Court invented. Now, you're talking about what happened in the 80s. There were so, uh, some other changes, too, to the 1871 law. Like in 67, we started seeing these different ideas that maybe police should be given much more authority uh, on a national scale. So I'm just wondering, has this qualified immunity gotten to a place where, coupled with union involvement on a local level, to where you could have a whole lot more bad actors? People are, are, are concerned. I'm looking at this data. Of it. In fact, um, Rich Lowry did a, an article called the cops shoot people for different, of different races for the same reason. The cops shoot people of different races for the same reason. And then when you look at the data, it says, how many cop shootings have we had? A thousand in one year? OK, so very few are unarmed. But there's something broken in our culture to where the confrontation is there to where people would shoot. Yeah, the bad guy. But also on the cop side, there must be something that we're missing. 
You know, it's clearly something is, is broken. Um, there was a poll, a Gallup poll last summer that said that public confidence in police has fallen to the lowest levels that it's ever been measured. And obviously that's a problem. And it's not just a problem for us, it's a problem for the police. Well, they, yeah. they need the confidence. And it's a problem public. for the young boy who says, man, I really wanted to be a cop, but I don't think so. I, I think that's right. Yeah. Uh, my uncle was a, was a career law enforcement officer. Mm -hmm. My neighbor is a retired DC homicide detective. They are fine, upstanding people. Um, and I don't see either one of them uh, saying that they need some kind of a special defense that the rest of us don't get. Mm -hmm. If they do something wrong, they're going to step up and take responsibility for it. Um, the problem with the qualified immunity doctrine, so-called, um, is that it prevents police from being held accountable. Okay, let's talk about that for a minute then. Let's talk about some of the changes. In fact, what was intriguing about me and why um, we're thankful that you came is that Cato seems to be alone in saying, hey, there are, there are solutions, there are things that we can do. It does, it's not a one or the other. It is open season for us to, as a nation, talk about should other changes be made to this. If we're talking, we haven't seen any changes since 87, perhaps, uh, I was just looking at the different coalitions that say, guys, I mean, when you have the hard left and the hard right on the same page on something, yeah. I'm going to take a second look at it. So explain to me some of the thoughts about uh, some of the discussion, because we want to talk to our, our audience as well, uh, surrounding what's going on in the Congress right now, and then explain to me what Cato has come up with. Sure, you bet. So let's be clear. This is not about vilifying police officers. It's not about saying that they're all bad people. To the contrary. Oh, that's what the left tries to narrate right. it out. And then, and next thing you know, the police are now on the defense. This is not, you're right, that's not what this is about. We no. don't want our, our police officers afraid to go into communities or on the defense because now everybody thinks they should be dismantled. But if we have this one-size-fits-all law that is being abused right. by some officers, it would seem that the good officers would want that change, too. Well, you bet. Look, would you want to be lumped in with Derek Chauvin if no. you were a police officer? I sure wouldn't, no. right? And uh, they were just as appalled to see that. Absolutely. So what we want is a mechanism that enables us to fine tune that and distinguish the good ones from the not good ones. Let me give you an example. In uh, Nebraska, which is um, in the same federal court jurisdiction as Minnesota, which is where George Floyd was murdered, um, there was an incident where uh, a woman was swimming in a pool with her, her children and her boyfriend. Um, they were horsing around. Some people misinterpreted what was going on, called the police. Police showed up, got him out of the pool and started talking to him. And they thought she was the victim. She said, no, we're, we're just messing around. She, in the middle of the interview, and remember, she's the purported victim. In the middle of the, the interview with the police officer, she looks over and notices that somebody's hassling one of her children. She says, I need to go take care of my child. I'll be right back. And he said, no, you need to stay here and talk to me. She turned and began to walk away. And she, this is a five foot tall woman wearing just a bikini, no weapons. He comes up behind her, lifts her up in a bear hug, turns her upside down and slams her head into the ground so hard that he knocks her unconscious and breaks her shoulder. She then sues and the court throws the case out on qualified well, immunity grounds. Qualified immunity. Not because what he did was okay, but just because they didn't happen to have that exact same case. That is what we need to dial back. But then let's dial it back. Right. What is Cato proposing? What is it that you guys are saying should be part of this discussion as we have our United States um, government take a look at this. You bet. So the great news is how easy this is to fix. It really is. Okay. What we do is we dial back to the policy that Congress chose in 1871, that if you violate somebody's rights, they can hold you liable. Now, what we proposed actually um, provides significant compromise to law enforcement. We proposed to go even further than that and say, look, if you were acting in good faith pursuant to some order that you received, right, or some policy that turns out not to be valid, but at the time it was reasonable for you to think that it was, mm -hmm. then you get immunity. You cannot be sued, mm -hmm. right? Um, that's Look at the facts and then, and, and, but okay, go ahead. Mm -hmm. But if you're that police officer in Nebraska mm -hmm. who pile drive that woman onto the ground simply because she made you feel frustrated, they can. <laughs> you have to go in front of a jury and explain why you made that decision. Right. And you have to convince them that it was a reasonable decision. Right. And if you can't, then you're gonna be held liable. What's not to like about that policy? Well, what is, what's not to like? So what is to like? I like it. And what about um, Senator Tim Scott leading the charge on the Republican side? Does he like it? What about whoever is opposed to policing it all together? Do they like it? I am deeply concerned about where things stand because the law enforcement community has come up with what they call a compromise. But I really think it's not a compromise. I think it's a kind of a wolf in sheep's clothing. Here's what they're proposing. That if we get rid of qualified immunity, we change the law so you can no longer sue the police officer who, who made the decision to violate your rights. You can only sue the employer, which is to say the police department, which is to say who? 
us. Oh, no, that doesn't sound very cool, because not only us as taxpayers, I'm a, as an employer, if you're telling me that if one of my employees slaps the other one, they're coming to sue me? Yeah, that's... that's no, that doesn't It doesn't cool. work, right? Yeah. And what I like to tell people is, if you remember how we handled the 2008 mortgage crisis, which is we let all the bad actors off the hook yeah. and stuck taxpayers with the bill, yeah. then you're going to love this proposed compromise because oh, it's the exact same thing. It's the exact same it thing. It sure oh, is. No. Yep. It doesn't sound really good. So where, where do we stand today? We've got a few minutes <clears> to say, what can people do then? Because the discussions are taking place, yeah. and they're going to come up with something. And I think that a year from now, we don't want to be here again to where we've seen 100 videos again and have all communities burned down, subjected to peaceful protests protesters right. as a result of another police killing. Well, there's a great point. Why, why should we have a policy that makes people feel so frustrated, right? If They're, they're not just going out in the street, you know, uh, on a lark. They're, they're angry. Now, yeah, it's, yeah, go ahead. Well, look, I'm not, I'm not defending that. what they're doing. Okay, I'm I saying... Know, but the, there is anger. And, and there's you know, anger. And I'm going to actually see to you there because the data shows that anger. The right. da and, I, and, and they're saying that our voice is just not being heard. And I don't agree with the tactics whatsoever, but the data is really clear that People are not seeing this issue the same. Let me give you another example. The, the, a couple weeks ago, there was this horrific video that was released of police um, uh, taking into custody a nine-year-old girl because she was having an emotional meltdown. And when she, she, they handcuffed her, and when she wouldn't slide into the squad car fast enough, they pepper sprayed her right in the eyeballs and then told her that she did it to herself. Right? That's making people feel angry. It, That's making them feel frustrated. Let's fix it. Yeah, I was reading this one. Um, it was put, brought up in Rich's column. He said, okay, the George Floyd video was awful to watch, but so is the video of 2016 death of Tony Tempa. I had not heard of him. And it was, um, uh, it was a, he was in the custody of Dallas police officers. And you guys, I'm gonna tell you something. It's almost the same thing we saw. He said, suffering from mental health problems, Tampa himself called the police. He was unarmed, but struggled when handcuffed behind him. The peace, police pinned him down, face down. He repeatedly said, you're killing me. He, they, he was having trouble breathing, in fact, dying. And when he stopped breathing, the police joked about him being asleep. And the cops and paramedics were slow to try to render life-saving aid. This is a problem. It is a problem. I mean, that man called for help. He had mental health problems. He was off his meds. And when the police showed up, they didn't help him. They killed him. And when they put him on the gurney, his lifeless body on the gurney, one of the police actually can be heard on the video saying, man, I hope I didn't kill him. Well, you did. You did kill him. And guess what happened? When his family sued, the court granted qualified immunity and said, well, we don't have that exact case on the books, and so I'm not saying what happened was okay, but because we don't have that exact same case, then you can't sue these guys. We have to fix this. Well, we do, but then how do, how do you end up with um, judgments, like I think in the George Floyd, there were $27 million or something. How did that get around this qualified immunity? Um, because the city was scared to death. Uh, same thing in the Breonna Taylor case. Okay. That was a $13 million settlement. Mm -hmm. In both of those cases, if the city had decided to fight in court, uh, or more, more precisely, if the officers had decided to fight in court, they absolutely could assert, yeah. Well, oh yeah, they could assert and qualified immunity. And off. And well, look, I've looked. There's not a case on point in Minnesota where somebody knelt on somebody's neck for nine and a half minutes till they died. So it would have to be that exact same instance, or exact he would have gotten away, the city would have gotten away, but because of the pressure and all eyes balls on them right. because of the videos and because of everything we have on the internet, they just went ahead and settled. That's this right. is not the way to secure a country. This is no. not an idea of how we're going to be free. And I think that, um, as you pointed out, the original intent of the first law was so that all of us could be free. And I think that if we can come up with solutions similar to what you're saying, Akita, why, why not have liability insurance? Everybody has liability insurance. If you do something, even if it were um, uh, by accident, if it were by accident, you're going to get your day in court and you'll be able to... Um, oh, I mean, so address this question, because we've got one little minute, though, but yep. I want to address this question, because you keep hearing it's going to hinder the police from doing their job, that, they're, that they only have split second to make a decision. Right. I agree, but I mean, I, walking chew gum, I, I think split second's a long, long time. Look, it, it's a hard job, and it, it can is. be a dangerous job. It and is a dangerous job. They don't know what they're walking into these days. The, the society is broken. That's right. We're out of control. I get that. So, so here's what the what people need to understand is that if you get rid of qualified immunity, it doesn't mean that every police officer is going to be liable every time they make a bad decision. Mm -hmm. They're just going to have to go in front of a jury and explain why they did the thing they did. And juries tend to be very sympathetic with police because they know what a hard job it is. What is the problem of saying to a police officer, for example, the one who pile drive the woman in Nebraska, go explain that. Right. If you've got a good reason for it, they'll listen to you. 
right? But but that doesn't happen right now. What happens now is judges just throw those cases out. They didn't have a choice. They have to just throw it out. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Clark. Pleasure. It's just so uh, refreshing to hear another perspective on a very important topic, and my panel is going to dive deeper into it, so I'll be right back. Too important a topic for us not to discuss on Cure America. So I have a distinguished panel, uh, really a good panel today, because we have two police officers with us, or former police officers with us. But I also have my most favorite constitutional attorney, Jonathan Alexander. Hey, thank you for being with us. Thanks. Attorney, senior counsel for government affairs at Liberty Council Action. Uh, we all know that this is the place to go if you have problems in the Christian community with um, people trying to sue you. Uh, but no, they're dedicated to advance in religious freedom, the sanctity of life, family issues since 1989. And they actually provide pro bono assistance when it is something of urgency uh, related to these topics. So we really appreciate you guys over there, and you know it, right? Yes, ma'am. Thank you for having me once again. I'm looking forward to hearing your perspective on this because I, I didn't even know anything about a qualified um, immunity. Yeah, we'll see um, but I, I, well, When I de found out about it, you know, I had to call one of my pa favorite pastors, <laughs> my favorite pastors, um, uh, Reverend Charles Winston McNeil. Thank you again. He's senior pastor of Unity Baptist Church here in Washington, D.C. Some of you have met him before because he's my go-to sometimes when it comes to these policing matters that we've been dealing with in particular over the last year. Pastor McNeil is part of Cure's clergy program. He also served in the U.S. Army as well as was a police officer here in Washington, D.C., and he's also in, uh, worked with a network of other clergy here in the Baptist community. So thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting me. Really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Looking forward to hearing your perspective as well. Um, this, you know, the Congress is talking about this, so we better too. Everybody knows something's going wrong. <laughs> what's the old saying? Who are you going to believe? Them or your own eyes? And so we need to see what's really going on. So I appreciate it. I have a very new guest, Jason C. Johnson. You're the president of Law Enforcement Legal Defense Fund. That's interesting. Over 20 years, you were a police officer, law enforcement officer, and executive. He served as deputy commissioner of the Baltimore Police Department and as chair of the Baltimore Police Department Performance Review Board. And this is the board that I understand conducts the detailed internal reviews of all of these types of cases, deadly force, police officers. This is a fascinating special guest. And well, thank you. That's good to be with you. Uh, should I tell my audience that when I saw him, I'm like, yeah, he's a police officer, all right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't hide it well. And then I said, and then I said, uh, and probably the son of a police officer. You said, no, nope, first and last. First and last. Because it's a problem. It is. Policing is a problem today. And I understand that you may even disagree with our first guest from the Cato Institute who says we need to get rid of this qualified immunity because it, it will hurt policing. Um, I mean, it will help us as a society if we get rid of it. Um, and you're thinking it'll hurt policing. That might be a problem with us saying get rid of this protection in law. So I'd like to start there. What We know the, we can see it. We can see it. So maybe we should just dive right into it. Sure. What is that issue? Why is it that you have police unions and policemen saying, don't do this to us, but you have others, including myself, leaning that way to say, this sounds like it's in the way? Well, first of all, I think we have to put it all in its proper context. So qualified immunity applies to all government employees. It's not just something special for law enforcement. It applies to all lower level government employees. Oh, is that why they treat us so bad over there at the IRS? It could be. It could be. <laughs> but higher level, higher level uh, executives, judges, legislators, they have that. Prosecutors, they have absolute immunity. Okay, so it's not qualified on anything. They have absolute immunity. Okay. Uh, Meaning lower, they can never be sued. Not for anything that relates to their decision making process for okay. their job. Okay. They cannot Correct. be sued because I think that this is something we have to explain. They can't be sued in civil court for something that had to do with their decision-making process. So if a judge says, this is what I see, he, they, no one can come back and say, Correct. I'm suing you for that decision. And that's okay. because of their judicial immunity. And so they have a judicial absolute immunity. Explain what the police officers have. They have qualified immunity. And so okay. do teachers and firefighters and uh, sanitation workers, all, all, all lower level working and government employees have qualified immunity. Now qualified immunity is qualified, so you have to qualify for it. And um, you know, Professor Joanna Schwartz from Yale Law School did a study a couple of years ago yeah, mm -hmm. to determine how frequently police officers are actually, it blocks lawsuits against 
against police officers. And she found it's only about 4% of the time where there's a lawsuit against a police officer, and that case is dismissed be just because of qualified immunity. So I think when I say give it context, I mean let's, let's actually look at how frequently qualified immunity comes into play. Yeah, but I don't know, because that might mean that people don't do it because they know that they're not going to win anyway. So I'm not sure that I, I saw a lot of her work. I thought I had it over here. But let's, let's, um, let's look at the reasons one might want to sue a police officer. I mean, people were appalled by what we saw in that video. And then to find out that, well, there are things that can be done to maybe get rid of yeah. bad cops. Um, well, that's probably why it's on the discussion table. None, none of the cases that we're, we're all familiar with, the, the mm -hmm. Derek Chauvin case and many other cases of, of supposed police misconduct, none, none, of, none of those cases, qualified immunity won't impact the recovery of the survivors or of the victims of the police conduct. It just okay. isn't. Those cases, just, many of those cases have already settled. Um, well, so there's already too. been a settlement. So there was yeah. no impact. Qualified immunity did not. Didn't help him. I mean, we talked about that a little bit. But, uh, Pastor, I'm going to come to you. A former police officer, D.C., I mean, mm -hmm. this is hard work. Mm -hmm. And I get that. And I just don't want anyone to think by us trying to search for the truth in this that we're saying that bad things about police officers. Everyone understands authority. That's why I have my scripture open to submit to the governor authorities. They don't carry the sword for nothing. You, If you're good, hey, you don't have anything to worry about. But if you're bad, you should be afraid. We know that. What's going on? What, tell, tell me your thoughts on, 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 on what the former officer, your colleague, just said and, and what the Cato guy is saying. Hey, get rid of this stuff. Well, you know, um, Star, you know, uh, since I've been coming, we've always talked about uh, policing. And one of the things that I've always said is that we have to put the humanity back into policing. Uh, what we're seeing now uh, is a lot of bad uh, cops, bad actions. And we have to be able to say, hey, look, this officer uh, uh, in the George Floyd case, in that case, uh, that was bad act. Uh, and he has to be held accountable for that, all right? All right? Qualified immunity, whatever. Uh, we have to now be, a, how are we gonna change this culture uh, in policing? How are we gonna change the behavior uh, of these officers if we continue to have this qualified immunity piece there? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I don't think you should get totally uh, get rid of it, mm -hmm. but maybe you need to look at it. I'm not an attorney. You have a discussion about it. Yeah. Discussion about yeah. it. Because usually mm -hmm. when we were talking about this issue, and we have mm -hmm. since um, the mm -hmm. George Floyd video, I mean, my goodness, he, he didn't even, uh, and Shannon didn't even show any expression that he was troubled. He's killing a man. And we're all watching this. We're appalled. And we've had discussions about what's broken down in these communities that they're trying to fix. I mean, that's the last place you want to go to police. But if they don't parents, they don't have a pastor, they don't have a principal, they don't have a politician that's telling them you need to behave, then yes, they're going to run into the law. But, it, but the humanity part of it, we, I, 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 I want to hear what you're saying there because that is where many folks are concerned. We've not seen an actual surgery before, if you will, and mm -hmm. now we're seeing them over every day and they don't look good. No one wants to see a, a, a kid sh shot because she's stabbing someone. Mm -hmm. No one wants to see a man shot because a dog is already attacking him. He still won't drop the gun. So we know there's a culture breakdown. Mm -hmm. But what is that? policing role when they're protected by the union, now they're protected by this um, law, national law, is that encouraging more bad copying? I think it's encouraging more bad actions. Bad uh, actions. Yeah, okay. I think it's encouraging more, more bad actions. Uh, because, because copying's within their training. So right. Yeah. You know, okay. you know, so because if the, if the cop, you know, when I was a cop in D.C., I acted within my training. OK. Uh, not only did I act within my training, but I also acted within my humanity. Okay. Uh, even there were times when I was on the street that I could have used deadly force. Wow. But because of my concern, my humanity uh, 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 of not hurting someone uh, and, and not judging someone yeah. or prejudging someone uh, made me look at it in a different way. Okay, how can I de-escalate okay. this situation? How can I bring wow. this down? You know, th there are options. Well, now, you have I was that on, option because if you look at what happened with that police officer mm -hmm. and that woman, I don't, I'm on the side that that was a good shoot. He didn't have a choice. That girl was giving oh, it. Yeah. I mean, you're in an act. Jonathan, mm. Look, I don't. I, the, the unions are protected on a local level. Now this immunity is uh, qualified immunity is protected on a national level. 
is it a protection they need? You're, you're a constitutional lawyer. Yeah, is I, there something we can do to make it so that it's more equitable? Yeah, certainly. And I think the, the discretion that officers want to show, the humanity that officers want to show, is bolstered by qualified immunity. And in the context that it is more than just an officer that gets this qualified immunity, um, one of the tenets of qualified immunity is that this person is acting reasonably. So this person can make a calculation. They can work through an issue. And oftentimes it is a split-second decision that they have to make at the time. Qualified immunity allows an individual both entering into the career of policing to say, well, I, I can still maintain my humanity, I can still maintain my you know, judicial approach to evaluating a situation and not have the threat of financial damages if I make an error or what someone considers to be an error. Which, you kinda, which is a concern because you don't want an officer who's getting ready to go into right. a home, or with, uh, someone mentioned the Breonna Taylor situation, to have to say, I don't want to lose my house yeah. over what, this. What's the, uh, this what's is, the this cost? Is, this is something that I think that the people that are demanding everything change, that it's so systemic that we have to just oh, don't understand. These are situations, then we got to find the details right. after the videos have gone mm. viral or parts exactly. of them. It's creating a problem and a tension racially and it just, just in communities because right. in my community, I don't have a problem out in Southern California community because we're more good than bad. Mm -hmm. So we just kind of let everybody right. kind of live their life and the uh, police eat there and, and um, you know, they're right next to you at the restaurants and in the grocery store. So we've got to de-escalate this cultural tension. Right, and, it, and it's, if the cultural tension is what's feeding a long-standing law, and often you hear what well, qualified immunity, immunity is you know, judicially created out of whole cloth. But no, it has, you know, it has common law, the sovereign immunity, as it was already mentioned, the absolute immunity for a judge to be able to make a decision. So, so it has its backing there. Qualified immunity wait, isn't. Wait, 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 hold that thought because you mentioned a term that was mentioned with um, uh, with uh, Clark and Cato, mm -hmm. uh, that whole term. What is this? Right. Uh, he, whole you know, cloth. Yeah. Whole uh, cloth. Part of the myth is that this comes out of absolutely nowhere, and, and that's not true. There's, okay. you know, common law all the way dating back to English common law. That you couldn't sue the king in his own court. That was that was sovereign immunity. But judges and prosecutors, uh, ADAs, are able to still do exercise their you know judicial work. They're able to make pronouncements and judgments, and not worry about the threat of being sued. That gives them the absolute immunity within the context of what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And this qualified immunity is just you know a, a step, a lower standard, but still a step allowing individuals that are in the public space, that are public officials, to do their job, use their discretion, and not have that same threat of suit. And I, I just I just want to make one more point that it's not. And it's a balancing test. It's not a, a clear blank check mm -hmm. to go out and do what you want. It's a balancing test where this individual is able to pre present a defense. It's an affirmative defense and saying, well, here are the facts. This is what was going on during the time. Judge, can you take a second look at this and see that I was doing my job, I made this decision. And even the judge that's looking on this, because it's done during a motion to summary judgment standard of the trial, they look at the facts in the way most favorable to the plaintiff. They look at the victim's perspective first when determining whether or not this officer acted within the color of law and they acted reasonably. So, so that might so be why the, why the officers would be against it, because a big, uh, the victim's story could be very compelling. What I'm hearing you say right. is that we could adjust this qualified immunity and the policeman still has that authority to do his job, but if, if he tries to take it before the judge, they're going to hear the victim side of it first, and now he gets to explain why. Well, Jason, I'm wondering if that's acceptable, and, and for this reason, uh, the culture has changed. The culture has not only changed to where we have really aggressive suspects, we have really aggressive victims, and we have really aggressive policemen who grown up in this culture who now policing is their job and it's union protected. So I'm wondering, is there a compromise somewhere that we can say, what's the 35,000 for us all to feel that we're making progress mm. to bring us together so that the police are not afraid of their own suspects and that the people are not afraid of these suspects, but also that the suspect is not afraid of the police to where they make stupid decisions like I'm already under arrest and I'm going to try to get away. This is horrible what's broken down. 
Well, it's largely a product of sort of where the power dynamics are right now, because the police are so much under so much scrutiny mm -hmm. and so much pressure. Right. Uh, they're they are very hesitant to act because they're afraid right. that they're going to be judged based on a 30 second well, YouTube they video. Are. I mean, they have to wear the right. cameras themselves. In fact, I was just in Los Angeles and they're brand new, um, probably COVID paid uh, motorcycles to, to protect and to film. And I'm hmm. like, and so I'm staring at it. So of course now he's following me because he's wondering why I'm staring. I'm not staring at you, dude. No, I don't have a Black Lives Matter sign in my window. Uh, but I am driving a high-end car. I'm just trying to read this because it used to say to protect and to serve, <laughs> and now it says to protect and to film. So this frustration in the police. I keep hearing about a hesitancy, but frustration can go the other way too. That we see more aggression, more yeah. more more anger because this was just last weekend. And yes, he then began to follow me, and I'm sitting there thinking. Okay, this is not going to work out well, especially since I already knew the topic of the show I'm going to do next week, and I want the truth. I don't want to come in and cry about, and they are so aggressive, and I didn't even make the statement of the show because I was in jail because I just <laughs> said the wrong thing at the wrong time. There is a problem, though. There is a problem that I want police to recognize as well, that, that you know, a lot of African-American men are saying, I'm just sick of every time I go anywhere, now I've got my hands on my steering wheel, I've got to be looking down on vitamin, and they know that I live up there. They know that I, this is my route every day. So where is the, where's the balance? What is it that we need to be thinking about? Well, step one, I think, for a constructive conversation around policing has got to be we all have to kind of focus on what the facts are. Okay. There's lots of rhetoric. Each case. Well, for, yes, just that's each. that's okay. right. Each case has to be looked at just on its own, uh, based on the facts of that case. So you're saying the first order of business is let's all take a deep breath. The minute we see an instance, whether it's on the Internet, whether it's right. noisy, the news, What's the facts? Correct. No. We, we need to know the facts of the case. Often we, we don't know early on. We get a snippet of video, we might hear a oh, quote yeah. from the police department, but we don't know the whole story. Oh, we found out the Michael Brown story years later. It was like, whoops. Yeah, that happened? wasn't exactly right. Well, it was represented in the beginning. Not, only, right? yeah. not exactly right. It was a lie. <laughs> An <Yeah>. absolute <laughs> lie. Yeah. And now you can't even get the truth out. Yeah. So, That's okay, true. so we get the facts, yeah. facts, which we know we're not going to be able to do because we got to enter yeah, it. Let's look. just say that the majority of Americans say, let me calm down, let me breathe, let me give a benefit of the doubt, because the police have that authority. But I, I go ahead, because I- It doesn't go against accountability just to allow an investigation to happen and allow for there to be some due process. That doesn't- People don't trust the police. I, I was looking at the data, they're just saying they don't mm -hmm. trust them. So yeah. if you don't have, if you have a society that doesn't trust their the law enforcement, <laughs> I'm not sure that just waiting for facts is yeah. where you're going to Well, you got to increase transparency. Okay, increase transparency. You have to increase transparency, transparency clearly. Yeah. Early mm -hmm. video, early release of videos is good. A withholding video is not good. Well, that's early what, explanation I, is I'm good. Gonna, I want to talk about that. And Esther, I'm going to talk about that one with you because we understand that a lot of reasons that the videos aren't released really early is because of these unions. These unions are everywhere, and they're not allowing the people to get the facts. So we're going to get more from our panel right after this. It's time for a cure. Cure is a coalition of new voices with new ideas that will become new policies. We are the cure. The Center for Urban Renewal and Education, headquartered in Washington, D.C., Cure works with churches, political, and business leaders on behalf of urban communities. Cure's mission is to address issues of culture, race, and poverty from a Judeo Christian perspective. Cure, join with us. There has never been a better time to help black communities. that, um, you know, I don't want a police officer who's my pastor or the politician or the parent or the principal. I want a police officer to be armed and ready to keep my neighbor sent away from me if he thinks he's threatened me. Uh, that's their role. And so there's been a lot of discussion about this militarization of police officers and they're trained killers and then they're union protected. We're just hearing a whole lot of bad stuff. So I'm so glad I have uh, police officers with me, former police officers. Jason Johnson, president of Law Enforcement Legal Defense Fund. That must be really interesting because now this sounds like you are gathering funds to help police officers who um, might find themselves in a crisis, might be standing before the judge. Yeah, we do. That's actually a big part of what we do is we raise money to support the legal defense of law enforcement officers who are wrongfully charged with wow. crimes related to their work. My goodness. You know, I met a Uber driver um, just a, within the last couple of weeks. I was down in Dallas 
and she drives Uber specifically to raise money for the wives of officers that have been wounded. She says, I don't want them to go to work. I don't, young girl, black girl, 35 maybe-ish. And, and the only reason I'm like, well, that's an interesting, she said, yeah, we've had a whole lot of wounded lately. I'm like, yeah, no, the summer of love left a whole lot of damage behind. But, um, but then I said, well, so why are you doing this? She said, because I'm a police officer. And I was very surprised that this young woman is still a police officer. So thank you um, for what you're doing because um, and who wants to be a cop these days? I'm telling you. Um, and, but I have a former police officer also, Reverend Charles McNeil. He's senior pastor of Unity Baptist Church. And I think you're still encouraging young men to say, hey, you need to be a police officer. This is a good profession. So mm -hmm. thanks for being with us. And then Jonathan, our constitutional attorney, Jonathan Alexandre, who can only give us limited information because they have some cases um, that are uh, involving this issue as well. But Really appreciate your perspective in this. Sure, thank um, you. I'm going to come back over here to Jason because right before the break, we were talking about you know some steps to try to heal us. You said that okay, first of all, everybody take a deep breath. This is what's going on right now is unacceptable, and it is. Yeah. The, the, the whole society has been taken over by, frankly, these progressive Marxists who want communism. We get that. Not everybody gets it, but that's what's going on. We know it, and it's not fair to the rest of us that just want unity and we want police officers to be. I guess men and women, but a badge, it represents something. We, you, we, so that's the first step. We got to calm it down. The second thing you said is that we need the video sooner. But, and I mentioned that this is where we can be problematic because these unions don't want those videos out. And then I want you to address that a little bit. And then I want Pastor um, uh, to address this, this militarization question. And I want both of y'all, I won't be the one just mm -hmm. throwing out. I need to know the answers on this. Are you guys over militarized and over unionized? I think in some jurisdictions, the unions have too much power. So unions are okay to bargain for things like salaries and benefits and things like that. That's what unions really exist for. But in law enforcement, some unions have become uh, over involved in regulating the discipline process for police officers. And in those cases, I think they need to take a step back. And in, in some cases, they are taking a step back. You mentioned uh, video, a release of body worn camera video. And I think. Uh, by and large, unions understand the importance of getting facts out there early mm -hmm. in order to maintain the public confidence. I don't think they're as adverse to that as, as we may think from, from back decades ago. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of militarization, I, I happen to believe that police are not over-militarized. There may be some exceptions to that. There may be some departments or situations that are, mm -hmm. have, lent, have lend themselves to that. Mm -hmm. But we have to remember that even though we want uh, police officers to have uh, you know, a soft touch and a human side to them. We also have to remember that sometimes they have to respond to thing, to incidents where there's a, an exceptionally high amount of violence, uh, active shooter situations and things, mm -hmm. things that are like potentially terrorist attacks. They have to be prepared for that. So we don't want that to be the mask they wear with the general public, but we want them to, be, to quietly be prepared for that. And I think... But I think in their training, then they, there must be something that teaches them to discern what kind of maybe the dispositions of us. I mean, I don't want to enter all of your secrets, or maybe I do. Um, but you mentioned something. Pastor, hold your thought, because I want you to address mm. this militarization thing, because this is a discussion coming too strong out of black America. Now they're talking about um, demilitarizing. We hear about the military itself, but now policemen? OK, this is going to be an interesting walk over the next few years. But you mentioned in passing the differences in different departments. I think this is getting lost, too. Yeah. Every department is not the same, is it? Every union of every department. Cities have different suburbs, have their mm -hmm. own. Can you just, in a couple of sentences, tell us, is that true that we don't have a nationalized mm -hmm. system? And I don't think we want one. I don't think we want one. We do have 18,000 law enforcement agencies, though. 18,000 mm -hmm. law enforcement agencies. agencies. State, local agencies. Really, one size fits all, guys? You really want that? OK. <laughs> Militarization. Tell me, what is this, and what 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 happens in this training? Are these trained killers? Uh, everyone they see. Well, that's what they're saying, and you know it. Yeah, I know it. Yeah. <laughs> they're telling us that we have at least trained killers all the way back to slavery, and now they're after the brothers. Well, it goes back to uh, the militarization piece. Uh, is pretty much when you're seeing a, a whole lot of 
tanks and things like that rolling up into, quote, the hood. Uh, that is what people are beginning to see. Uh, when you see them come out in the military type gear, uh, that's what you're looking at. You're looking at also the re uh, recruitment. You're having a lot of officers who are coming out of uh, these uh, military situations, you know, like these different type of uh, wars or, or, or that they've been in. Okay, so they've been to war and now they've become a police officer. Right, so so you, you're dealing with that a little more. And and, and then you know you that being in... So you're saying that in the recruiting process, we're seeing more rogue cops because they're really... Former soldiers who who are policing in the, who have to police in Iraq, but you cannot police the way you in Iraq the way you can here. But in don't America. they train them to be a police officer? You can train a person, but even with their mentality, if you if that military baron is still there, he's there. So you mm. might not want mm. former mm. Uh, military to be police officers. No, no, no. You you still want them to be, but you, I think you need to take another step in the psychological evalu evaluation mm. uh, of, of the officer. Or at least have a yearly evaluation of the officers. Uh, when I was on specific in, to those that came out of the military. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you got to look at this PTSD thing. You got to look at all that that that, that comes with that officers on a continuing regular basis. When I was on the police department in D.C., we had a yearly physical, which also uh, required us to have a psych evaluation to determine if we were still fit to be a police officer. Okay. Some of the things that you see as a police officer on the street uh, may desensitize you over a certain number of years. That's true, too. Mm -hmm. And we know that with any profession, people mm -hmm. need a break, and that's why we have to always take our vacations and make sure that we're... Uh, mm -hmm. And But this is... Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Jonathan, mm -hmm. tell you, this, this is culture. Because when you have marriage broken down, based on what the pastor said, you have all this pent-up frustration. Marriage would cure that kind of stuff. Because instead of taking it out on your neighbor, you take it out on your wife, and you guys didn't make <laughs> up later. You just fuss, fuss, fuss at the people closest to you. But culture has broken down. Yeah. You're, we're looking at a whole lot of male energy now in our urban centers that is just untrained. Their dad isn't there to channel that energy to sports or to school, and it's ending up in the streets, and it's costing us all. And I, while I'm concerned a little bit about now this question of, hmm, former soldiers are now policing, and the nature of unions, they're policing the poor communities because the nature of unions, the rookies and the rebels are going to be assigned the hardest jobs. Which comes first, yeah. the, 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 the try to demilitarize the police, or is, it, or is it that we need to do something about culture? Yeah, and I, and I think that, that's a fantastic question. I'll, I'll share personally. So I'm, I'm not always wearing a suit jacket. I'm not always in a suit. And I'm always an African American male. And I remember, uh, my wife and I bought the car that we wanted. We finally bought the car that we wanted. And I sent a picture to my dad saying, "Hey, check this car out." And he's like, "Congratulations, you know." Horrible financial investment, but but, but, but nice, <laughs> nice, nice looking car. They really are. Right. Right? Yeah. Um, but at least you're looking good. But 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 his first question was, how are the police down there with regard to a black man driving yeah. that mm -hmm. car? Because he's been in the back seat when we were driving his car, my brother and I, and have seen us get pulled over for absolutely no reason. Oh, the excuse oh. that the officer used wasn't wasn't a good excuse whatsoever. Mm -hmm. He's seen his sons. He better not say anything. Right. He's seen his sons pull into the home that he's paying for and having a cop follow behind them asking, what are you guys doing in front of this house? So he's seen his son, his sons, African-American males, uh, in interactions with police officers that were unlawful and were based on prejudgments made. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, he was the same father that taught us to respect authority, taught us that you know these men are, are standing in the gap in between you know, your criminal neighbor and you living a lawful life and remaining safe. He's one that taught us to dial 911 if an issue comes up and having the relief being shown when a police officer comes and you know, literally stands in the gap and rescues you from that situation. So it's always that balance that needs to be struck. Fathers continue to instruct their children to, to respect authority, but not being naive to the situations that of, of course occur consistently, um, um, oftentimes on a daily basis. The burden they carry. But it's interesting that um, you had a dad to teach you this. Right. So now we're looking at a whole lot of disproportionate amount of African-American young men who don't have a dad to teach them mm -hmm. that. And over time, you, you, you get mad. And now you have the politicians screaming to everyone to go and destroy if you don't get your way. You have the principal who's saying, oh, I don't want to even open the schools. These people can't learn. You, it's all broken. You have the, you, you, the, the pastors, well, the most of them didn't open their church over the last <laughs> year. And um, yeah. I'm just not sure where where we can heal this then, because now we're talking about the police officer himself who needs to 
t have more restraint, but is there a burden on the other side of the black male? You're shaking your head, Pastor. I want to hear from you to say, I have to have more restraint too. This, what this narrative is to tell us that it's all 100% the police and you get to do whatever you want to. I mean, now watch grown men just, just violate police personally and they're supposed to just stand there and take it? This is nuts. Well, you know, as an uh, African-American male, there's an anxiety even now with me. Uh, even if a cop just gets behind me on the beltway, right. I'm like, okay, let me get prepared. Mm -hmm. It's increased tension. It's increased tension. So now I got to start going through this whole process of my mind. Okay, what am I going to do if he stops me? How am I going to handle this? So now we have to start having a conversation, or we have had a conversation. I have a 19-year-old daughter. I have to have a conversation with her about dealing with the police officer. But how, are we going to also mm. have a conversation with her? Yes, we have mm. to, all that. And I've heard uh, politicians mm. on the TV. Well, we have to have conversations with our kids that others don't have. I'm like, I don't know if I, have, I know a lot of white people. Mm. And I don't know of any of them that don't have that conversation with their kids. So even to try to separate that out by race is, is offensive to me. So I think that maybe a conversation that also needs to be had is we need to know how to behave. Yes. Are we having that conversation in front of the conversation that you're going to you're if we assume that you're going to run into the law and you better behave because it's just what we have to do because they hate us. Or is it what the scripture says that they are that you have to be subject to them. It doesn't say love them. It says subject to them because the power that they have is given to them by God. Yeah, I, I think what we're saying is that that subject means respect. Uh, oh, that, I don't know. I that, looked it up. <laughs> and it says, being in a position or in circumstances that places one under the power or authority of another or others. Because that, I thought it meant respect, too. <laughs> but when our, officer, Maybe a little R, when, big our, R. when our officer has control over you, mm -hmm. there has to be a certain amount of respect. There's accountability on your part as well. Yeah. Uh, even if you didn't do anything wrong, uh, I have taught these young men and women to survive the moment. Okay. Survive the Survive moment. Survive the moment. Sur you, know, you, you know, get the officer's badge number, uh, uh, police squad number, uh, where you were located, all that. Start making a mental picture of that. Mm -hmm. And before you even leave the scene, write it down, the time, location, do all that. Survive the moment, okay. the moment so that you'll be able now, if there was something wrong, you can make a complaint. You can make a complaint. Mm -hmm. and, and they're wearing the cams and all that other stuff. I only have about four minutes with my panel, so I'm going to let them wrap it up because 10 things we know about race and policing in the U.S. Pew data. Majority of both black and white Americans say black people are treated less fairly than whites when dealing with the police. Black adults are five times more likely as whites to say that they're unfairly stopped by police. White Democrats and white Republicans have vastly different views on how black people are treated by the police. On and on and on it goes. Are we going to get out of this mess? Well, the, the one that you didn't report is a recent poll that said 70 percent of African-Americans are satisfied, at least satisfied with their local police department. So I think a lot of a lot of are at least satisfied are at least satisfied. Oh, they're at least satisfied. So they, so they move to where no, they're satisfied okay. and very satisfied. 70 percent. And I'm not surprised because 40 percent of blacks live in the suburbs, 75 percent of great middle class. We're well-behaved community. This little movement that has painted even all blacks uh, is is uh, as as rebellious against the police is not fair to us either. So go ahead. So I'm yeah. glad you pointed that. Well, out. I think I think the, the the narrative about police, the conversation about police, is a critical one. Certainly, we have to have it, but unfortunately, it's being in overly informed by what we see on the news rather than what we experience ourselves in our own lives and in our, in our own communities, regardless of your race or class. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think we need to continue to have the conversation, but I think it needs to be focused on factual information. So we can't just look at a 30 second blurb on TV and decide whether the, the officer was right or wrong or the officer was a racist or not a racist. We don't have enough information to determine that. To determine. We also have to consider the fact that you know police officers use less force now than at any time in history, particularly deadly force. It's been on the decline for the last 50 years. Well, I saw a chart showing that. Very yeah. big decline and decline even in death. So we are seeing an Correct. exaggeration. Only about 1% of region. arrests result in any use of force whatsoever. Wow. Um, over one majority of police officers will go their entire careers without using their firearm in the line of duty. We need to remember all these How many? Things. How many? 
go over their 90, course our, of their Our research is 95%. 95% of their entire course career. never have to even use their arm. Well, maybe we ought to have a show on how much they're getting paid to be doing nothing <laughs> faster. I know it's not a light issue. I'm just trying to make it light because I want healing. Mm -hmm. We're going to be able to do this. It probably starts local. Yeah, it's going to start local, and it's going to start with a conversation. Okay. Uh, it's going to start with us moving away from the cameras. Okay. Uh, it's going to start with community leaders coming together uh, and pretty much excluding some politicians and those who have agendas and really sit yeah. down and have an honest dialogue, um, be able to respond and be very transparent uh, in a, a reasonable manner. Uh, like the there is a problem, mm -hmm. you know, and I like what you just said, exclude those politicians right. mm -hmm. and all the activists that are having a, another agenda. Mm -hmm. I, I like that, but go ahead. Before you yeah, go ahead. And, 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 and really just sit down and have a conversation. Uh, one of the things that I, I, I was able to do in my Bible said when the uh, shooting in Ohio came, one of the young ladies said, well, Pastor, why did they have to shoot four times? I said, well, you know, I talked to her about the gun, the type of guns that they're carrying. And I talked to her about where uh, officers are trained to shoot center mass. We don't, you're not taught to shoot a leg or arm or a finger. You're taught to shoot center mass. Mm -hmm. And I say his training kicked in. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and from that, it became a justified shooting. That's exactly right. And there's some discussion mm -hmm. about training, and I'm sure over the course of time we're going to get a little bit more into that. But I, I think that um, the beginning is the they're trained to keep us all safe, yeah. Jonathan. Mm -hmm. So the community itself has a role in this. Absolutely. And the, the agenda, there is an agenda out there that is unfortunately making all the headlines and driving the discussion. And there are activists that, that don't stand for the rule of law that are unfortunately mm -hmm. the leaders in, in much of this conversation. So we need to retract. Personal responsibility works in several contexts. It certainly works in this context from the individual keeping themselves properly and behaving properly. And at the same time, personal responsibilities from law enforcement to from make sure that the color of law is executed in a way that valid and lawful. I think that that's why the conversation about this qualified immunity will continue as well because of that personal responsibility. Thank you. Thank you guys. This is an incredible discussion. It's part of the conversation and I'll be back with a few final thoughts. Now that was a powerful discussion. Having an important insight from two former police officers one a pastor, one working currently with police officers who say, I was just trying to do my job. They've been on the front lines. They've seen all sides of this argument. And I know that you really enjoyed the, the discussion with, the, with our special guest, with the attorney. We know law enforcement performs a vital function in our society. They keep us safe. They're, when we know that there's a problem, we go to 911. For some to talk about abolishing the police is just crazy. It's, it's irresponsible, it's reckless, and it's increasing racial tensions right now. But our country is being torn apart over these issues because policing right now needs serious reform when we start finding about different issues involved in their protections, whether it's union, whether it's uh, this immunity, we have to find an equitable way of solving the problems that we have in our society today. Pastor McNeil said community leaders have come together, have to come together. We have to talk to our children about right and wrong, what to do when you're in front of the authorities, the police, oh my goodness, when they pull you over, I tell you, this is tense. And we're seeing that tension, and we need to think about the right answers. Well, one right answer is personal responsibility. Personal responsibility must be the hallmark in a free country, whether we're talking about obeying the law or whether we're talking about enforcing the law. But if police have free license to violate citizen civil rights as they do under this qualified immunity, then the law has no real meaning. They're not responsible. When right and wrong becomes ambiguous, when personal responsibility becomes ambiguous, we're seeing the looting, we're seeing the rioting, we're seeing the confusion of a lot of people, and we're seeing the tensions rise. We're seeing the chaos. And you all know we've got to do something. Well, one thing we know we can do, we need to pray for our country. And we need to pray for those in authority over us. The scripture says we must. The scripture says we must be subjected to them. But we must have law authority that's over us that is also in line with the scriptures. That includes police officers. They must be, have, they have a tough job, but they must be responsible in that job. 
They're not above the law. So let's pray. Let's pray for those in government. Let's pray for the members of Congress, because they're now debating this issue. And that outcome can go either way right now, because the Democrats and Republicans are very split on what we need to do. We need to come out with at least one thing that can move forward uh, the, the conversations, the discussions. And that one thing might be over reforming, I guess I should say, this, um, this, this immunity. To be free, we must come up with right answers. And one of those answers might be this a qualified immunity needs to be reformed. Police should be local. Policing should be local. But this is a national issue, and we need to have a discussion about it more and more and more as we move to an equitable and freer society.